Welcome everybody uh, to join us this morning or this afternoon, midday, um, early evening, depending on where you are in the world, to talk about sustainable development and talk about sustainable development through the lens of protected and conserved areas. My name is Marianne Kettonen and I am the head of global, um, global challenges program at IEP, Institute for European Environmental Policy. I'm also wearing some other hats today uh, during this event. Um, I'm also co-lead of the um, Natural Solutions Specialist Group at the IUC and WCPA, WCPA standing for World Commission on Project Areas. And I am also one of the lead co-authors uh, for this publication we are talking, talking about today. Um, we've invited you today to join us in this online space to mark the launch of a guidance that shows how protected and conserved areas can support sustainable development goals across the board. So not only supporting the delivery of the sustainable development goals, which are linked to nature conservation specifically, so goals uh, on life on land and water, 15 and 14, but actually how protected and conserved areas can support much wider range of sustainable development goals from climate to fresh water, from food security to uh, peace and security, and also from uh, reducing poverty to increasing equity. So across the wide set of SDGs, area-based conservation is there for you. Um, the global partnership behind this guidance that we will be launching today uh, firmly believes that based on very concrete evidence through these case studies that we are, for example, showing today and, and talking about today, we see that area-based conservation really can and it needs to be recognized as a very proactive tool to support the delivery of the 2030 agenda. Uh, we know this, I think a number of people around this virtual table and listening know this as well, but we will really need this to be much more proactively recognized across the different actors around the, around the world, both on the ground, but also more at the higher strategic positions um, to be supporting the agenda, sustainable development agenda. So what we're gonna be doing today, we will be giving you an insight into this topic and also to our guidance through the eyes of the organizations and authors behind the uh, publication that we are launching today. We have a fantastic panel, uh, including representatives of the leading organizations, both in conservation and sustainability, who are also partners for this report. And we'll be talking about sustainable development and area-based conservation, first on a slightly more strategic level, uh, looking at this perhaps from a more global perspective, particularly perhaps from the perspective of the funders of the world, and also through the lens of the future, post-2020 towards 2030 goal for uh, biodiversity. And then we will be also looking at this topic and our guidance through the lens of work on the ground. So we have the pleasure to um, have a number of the case study authors or representatives of the case study authors joining us today as well in the panel to talk about um, how these cases uh, that we've been documenting show uh, area-based conservation developing, um, supporting sustainable development um, in real case scenarios on the ground. So that's that's the setup for today. A um, few words about housekeeping first before we start. So please do feel free to use the QA function at the chat. I'm a um, QA function of the webinar. I'm sure you're all familiar with that. So if you have any questions to ask about the guidance or to the speakers, please you know, put them in the QA and we'll try to pick them up um, while, while we go. If you have things that you want to share or chat among themselves, among yourselves as well, please use a chat function. It would be nice to see you chatting away while we'll be talking here, so make it slightly more interactive. And just also to inform you that we are recording the event um, because we do wish to, um, wish to then show the event uh, online later on. So uh, that's, that's going to be for the opportunity or for those who are not attending today to see, see the event. But um, without any further ado, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, co-author Nigel Dudley, um, who is also the co-chair of the um, Natural Solutions Special Group together with me, and also the thematic chair of the Natural Solutions at IUC and WCPA. So Nigel, I'm going to hand over to you to say a few words about the guidance first before we start the panel. Thanks. Lovely. Thank you very much, Mariana. I'm just going to show a couple of slides. They come through okay? Yeah. Okay, so thank you very much. 
Mariana, for starting us off. Um, lovely to see everyone on the call. This has been what was supposed to be a year project, probably with the pandemic became a, a two year project, multi organizational report looking at the role of protected and conserved areas in, in contributing to the sustainable development goals. Um, normally, you know, a project involving seven organizations would be a nightmare, but just because they'd all disagree, but actually this time it worked really, really well. And I'm, I'm really grateful to all the different people involved today and, and elsewhere for, for a really harmonious and, and positive um, progress. We're looking at the sustainable development goals through the lens of protected and conserved areas, which means protected areas as recognized by IUCN and the CBD, the Convention on Biological Diversity, which is national parks, nature reserves, wilderness areas, and also other effective area-based conservation measures, which is a much newer designation that came out of the Convention on Biological Diversity in 2010 and refers to areas where biodiversity conservation may not be the priority aim, but the management contributes to very effective biodiversity conservation, a new type of designation, which we're still coming to terms with, still working through. The guidance has three main steps. We have a, a series setting the scene, a, a section setting the scene, which looks at where sustainable development came from, explains protected and conserved areas, and discusses in general terms how the protected and conserved areas can contribute to various SDGs. Then the bulk of the report, it's a long report, um, which is a goal by goal guidance. And we look at 11 of the different sustainable development goals and discuss those in terms. And then at the end, we have the call for action, which both lays out some things which we believe as authors and editors that are critical next steps and also um, provides a uh, first way of, of measuring how any particular protected area might contribute to different SDGs. And one of the things that we are going to encourage in the follow up to this is to encourage protected areas to start reporting to their own governments about their contribution to the sustainable development goals. This is very important at the moment. The SDGs are not being met as quickly as we need to to meet the 2030 deadline. And so we suspect governments are going to be looking for additional information and additional benefits. So this is a really excellent time to, to bring those things to the attention of governments. So what will you see when you read the report? The, the, as I say, the bulk of it is looking SDG by SDG. Here's an example. We, we have a, in the main section, we have three subsections, what are the challenges, explaining what kind of problems, global challenges, uh, this particular SDG, this uh, under this SDG. Then a section looking at how effective area-based conservation can help in terms of either providing uh, ecosystem services, nature-based solutions, biodiversity conservation, what, what the particular um, elements are of importance to each SDG and then some of the approaches that support that SDG. What kind of protected area is going to be most important? How will it all um, fit together into a coherent program? And there, that general section is um, backed up by a series of case studies. And those case studies come from very broad ranging set of actors, not just the seven main partners, although we've got all got case studies in there, but also um, a number of other both community groups and uh, government agencies and so on. So really broad range of people involved and represented. And the case studies look at a broad range of protected area types, all the way from indigenous protected areas through state run protected areas. We have very few other effective area based conservation measures because we simply don't have those that they're being set, they were being set up during the time we were writing this. So we didn't have the experience to draw on. I think that's all I've got to say, Mariana. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you, Nigel. Um, I do hope you all like the look of it. I think that's one of the key elements 
of a good guidance is that people feel drawn to it. And we really have tried our best to do so, um, to uh, make it as pleasant and accessible and interesting for everybody who, who's hopefully interested and in the future also interested in this topic more and more and will be able to then use it and approach it. Um, fantastic. Um, Without any further ado, we will move on to our first panel because I'm sure you are all keen to also hear from our co-authors and um, partnering organisations, you know, what their thinking was um, when they joined, you know, this initiative and also now looking forward as to um, what the future looks like for area-based conservation and SDGs. So first panel, we are looking at the question as to why area-based conservation is central for delivering SDGs. And we have in this panel representatives from the UNDP, World Bank Group, and also World Health Conservation Society um, to, to enlighten us and give us their thinking. And first, um, I would like to invite um, Midori Paxton, Head of Ecosystems and Biodiversity from the UNDP, um, to join us. Uh, hi Midori, nice to see you and nice that you are spending your this Memorial Day um, holiday with us this morning, <laughs> like others from the US as well. Thank, thank you Marianne and uh, yeah it's a pleasure to spend time like this on the Memorial Day and good morning, uh, afternoon and evening everybody. Um, and as you know UNDP is the development arm um, of the United Nations. And if you look at our latest 2020 human development report, you can see the clear evolution of our thinking. So 20 years ago, nature and conservation were simply not in UNDP's strategies or narratives. They were considered a bit of a sideshow, but now it's on the main stage. I'm just uh, hoping to sort of outline how, you know, area conservation, area based conservation is important agenda within UNDP. And the human development report showed that, in fact, nature is the basic foundation of development. Uh, not only does nature provide us with the essentials of life, or the food, water, air, et cetera, but it's also essential to the way our world works, both economically and, and socially. And we have heard half of the world GDP is dependent on nature, and we also now recognize that nature is in a dire state of crisis. The sixth mass extinction is happening now, and the million species may vanish in, in coming decades. So this is why UNDP takes protected and conserved areas so seriously and has them as a priority. Uh, the benefits are profound. If you protect a mangrove ecosystem, you protect biodiversity. You also protect spawning ground for fish, uh, shrimp and crab, and, and protect land from erosion, from extreme weather events. And by protecting nature, you are also protecting people. And I'd like to give you also another example, uh, which are my favorite tigers. And if you want to conserve tigers, you must conserve their habitats and prey species. This involves protecting forests, for example. And these forests in turn regulate downstream water flow, Millions of people, hundreds of miles from the conservation area are shielded from floods, drinking clean water because of the tiger conservation areas. So essentially all countries therefore need to put nature at the very heart of development thinking and land use and sector planning. And we must remember protected and conserved area provides the only form of land use or sea use focusing especially on conservation and protection of biodiversity and ecosystem services. This is really important. Uh, that's why it's so relevant to our work as development agency. And in the last 18 years, we supported well over 200 conservation area projects financed by the Global Environment Facility and we have supported more than 2,500 conservation areas, including 300 plus new areas in over 130 countries, together covering areas larger than India. So all of them 
uh, different, of course, mangrove, tundra, uh, high mountains, uh, coral reefs, and the governance styles are also unique. Uh, some are managed by communities, some by NGOs, government, private enterprises, but all uh, serve the same purposes. They keep nature safe and, and benefit us all. And in Namibia, for example, we helped increasing the national protected area coverage from 17 to 20% of the country with increased ecosystem representativeness while developing policies and practices that directly benefit communities in and around the protected areas. And in Comoros, we supported establishment of its first national parks, which provide fisheries and tourism resources and opportunities and much more. And in the Philippines, we supported formal recognition of indigenous and community conserved areas and their integration within the national protected area system while ensuring protection of the rights of communities to natural resources and to their ancestral lands. So in a nutshell, protected and conserved areas have been and will continue to be a key support areas of UNDP so that we can unleash potential of the areas for sustainable development. And we always say leaving no one behind which is the principle behind the SDGs. And I would also say leaving no living thing behind. Uh, Fantastic. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Midori. Um, that sets us off beautifully, um, also giving us very concretely the breadth of um, sustainable development elements that um, protected and conserved areas can support. Um, so that was um, that was very, very good overview of that. Um, you said, did you say 2,500 protected areas? Like that's a, that's a massive number of protected areas, um, massive, but you know, good number of protected areas uh, around the world that you've been supporting over the over the past uh, past years and decade. Um, perhaps building on that, um, obviously we still have biodiversity sustainable development urgency, um, which we are looking at at the moment. Um, in that light, what further action is UNDP planning to take or or you would think UNDP perhaps should take to accelerate the progress um, and use of area-based conservation in the future to support SDGs, given that, you know, um, while we are trying and we have been trying, we still need to try even harder. So uh, where is UNDP going? Uh, what's your, do you have a target, for example, for the upcoming years as to how many project areas you wish to cover next, um, if in about years time? Yeah, basically, yeah, 2,500 sounds quite impressive, but uh, because we look at protected area system, we have system approach, so, you know, that could cover uh, so many uh, hundreds of protected areas in, in one country as well. But anyway, for, for the future, uh, from now on, I would like to perhaps talk about three different types of uh, contribution we, we hope to make in this space. Uh, firstly, we will continue to create tools and materials for awareness raising. And this publication we are launching today is one of those attempts. And also a few years ago, we looked at all the 169 SDG targets and analyzed how nature conservation is needed or can support achievement of the SDG targets. And the result was uh, quite astonishing. 50% uh, of all the targets require nature to achieve them or can be greatly assisted by nature conservation. And secondly, um, we will integrate area-based conservation approach within our COVID-19 recovery support, which we are very much focusing on as an organization. Uh, for example, we are piloting nature performance bonds to reduce debt burden of uh, programming countries, uh, which has been exacerbated, as you know, uh, by, by this pandemic, and thereby affecting countries' ability to finance conservation. So by linking debt relief with performance of nature conservation actions, countries will be able to accelerate progress in conservation area management for, while uh, creating fiscal space 
uh, in the budget for, for other sector priority programs. And we will be also strengthening our on the ground support advocating for laws of area based conservation in preventing future pandemics and decreasing their impact. So, for example, we are currently conceptualizing a project that aims to operationalize one health approach in biodiversity rich transboundary protected area landscapes uh, in, in the Amazon ecosystem across Peru, Ecuador and Colombia. Uh, this project will address issues related to wildlife management, illegal trade, and prevention of zoonotic diseases in an integrated manner. And I'm hoping that we can show that, you know, how things can be operationalized on the ground. And the thirdly, and lastly, through uh, around, we have currently around 200 uh, projects, and we continue to provide living examples of how area-based conservation tools are used to produce tangible development dividends. Here, what we are ultimately looking for is upscaling of these examples and behavioral change within the governments, businesses, and, and the communities. We will continue to demonstrate and amplify this kind of evidence and experience from our country and regional projects, small grants program, and a global uh, ICCA project, Nature for Development Program, and Biofilm Biodiversity Finance Initiative, and, and so on. And there are many platforms for amplification of experience, evidence, and learning. We co-lead the protected area thematic community of the Panorama Solution Platform, uh, platform hosted by IUCN and the GIZ, so we'll continue to do that, and we'll also be launching a new open planet portal, portal and provide more evidence of the efficacy of nature-based solutions from our portfolio, uh, including area-based conservation tools. So a lot is coming and there's a lot to do. And we really would like to be a catalytic force behind our collective effort. Uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll stop there for now. Thank you. Thank you, Midori. Indeed, it sounds like you know uh, UNDP plans to keep on going and, and increasing increasing the uh, support to area-based conservation in the sustainability space and showing showing some way there as well. I was really delighted to hear you mentioning including this aspect to the COVID-19 recovery, sorry, uh, COVID uh, um, recovery plans, because um, certainly that is really, really important um, in the upcoming year, upcoming years. Um, and looking at this from the European perspective, you know, we've certainly felt as a conservation community um, happy when we see how, for example, um, circular economy and perhaps climate feature in these plans. But we have been feeling a bit lacking in terms of, you know, how well biodiversity was, was you know, in the end highlighted so far in these plans. So fantastic if UNDP globally uh, keeps, keeps that momentum going and helps others to keep the momentum going as well. But um, thank you to Midori and just to say that a number of the um, UNDP's many cases and examples are, are featured in the publication. So please take a look um, of some of the, what you call it, like a bit of like a teaser in terms of what is going on at, at UNDP when it comes to area-based conservation SDGs. But moving on and moving on to Dr. Valerie Hickey, who is Regional Manager for Environment, Natural Resources and Blue Economy at the World Bank Group. So welcoming Valerie in and asking as a first question, how do the project areas and concerned areas feature at World Bank's strategic agenda? And obviously it's not a competition, but you know, uh, we've heard from Midori from UNDP, <laughs> how they're doing. So uh, over to you, Valerie, to tell us, you know, how's, how's World Bank um, seeing these things at the moment? Thank you, Marianne. Certainly ourselves in UNDP, we see ourselves not at all as competitors, but as collaborators. Sadly, there's enough problem to go around that it takes more than us, more than all of us around this table today to help with area-based conservation and development. And if you'll forgive me, I just wanted to take a minute, you know, you mentioned Memorial Day, Marianne, and I think it's a very auspicious day for us to have this conversation because here in the United States, of course, we're commemorating the men and women who gave their lives, as Abraham Lincoln said, in the last full measure of devotion. And they gave that to, to the ideals in some ways of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, which is the thread that runs through the sustainable development goals. 
And there's never been a more important time to talk and remind ourselves about the SDGs, which is something that hasn't been talked about a lot in this past year during COVID, because the SDGs have just become an awful lot more difficult because of COVID. We're, we're, Nigel mentioned that we're behind on them already. We were before COVID, we're even worse now. The World Bank, I focus at the moment on Latin America, just in Latin America alone, in 2020, they lost 7% of GDP, and that translates into 30 million people falling back into extreme poverty. And extreme poverty is a very nice way of saying catastrophic destitution. We can't even imagine that, those of us on, on the call today. And so, you know, it's so important for us to talk about any proactive tool we can find. And as you mentioned, Marianne, area-based conservation is a proactive tool to get those people out of poverty. That's at the end of the day, our job at the World Bank, our mission is to end poverty. And while that's the first SDG, we recognize that to do that and to make sure you end it for people and they, don't, they aren't vulnerable to falling back into poverty, you have to make sure sustainable development is green, resilient, and inclusive. And that means it covers all 17 SDGs. And we simply couldn't do that without focusing on area-based conservation as well. And that's because when we look, just like UNDP, we've had an evolution in our thinking and we've spent a lot of time thinking about what's the capital that people have that can be transformed into jobs and GDP into pathways out of poverty. And we all talk about physical capital. There's, there's been a wonderful newfound appreciation for human capital, but natural capital is also critical. In our lowest income clients, our lowest income countries, 47% of their wealth is in natural capital. So we can't possibly ignore that. We can't possibly allow that to degrade. We also have been doing a lot of work lately because of the importance of the jobs agenda and putting people back into work to look at what are those jobs that if you support, they create more jobs than anything else. And the truth is that jobs with the highest multiplier effects are jobs in natural capital management. It's in land use, it's in agriculture, it's in forestry. So these are the areas, it's in fisheries where we have to support. One of the greatest concrete examples I've seen recently and I've used is how supporting one ranger in one protected area in Nepal costs about $2,500. But that investment creates over $6,500 worth of jobs and GDP in that same community. So think about it. These are communities where we have rangers, where we often have protected areas that are remote, that are sticky po pockets of poverty where people don't have an awful lot of other pathways out of poverty. So investment in conservation can help enormously. And it's not just those small investments. I look at places like the Caribbean. In the Caribbean, tourism represents 15% of their GDP, brings in around $57 billion every year, pre-COVID understandably. Um, that's 14% of their jobs. Think about how important that is for the economy of those island countries and those coastal countries. All of that sun, sea, and surf tourism is purely based on natural capital that works. If the natural capital isn't there, nobody's going there. And we've seen a recent degradation of that natural capital. In the Caribbean, you have more than 2,000 pieces of litter on every kilometer of beach. That's four times more than the average amount of litter on beaches. And the degradation that that's leading to on the beaches is threatening that tourism, that sector that at the end of the day, is putting almost one in five people to work across the Caribbean. So natural capital is hugely important. Area-based conservation is critical as part of that. And that's why at the bank, we sort of have a, a three-step approach to thinking about area-based conservation. So the first is command and control. We have to have law enforcement. We have to make sure that the, the environmental laws, the local laws, the use laws are met and are managed properly and building the environmental infrastructure around making that happen, building the community and, 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 and national and local collaboration around, around command and control is important. The second thing we look at is how do we make sure that the opportunity costs of somebody living next to a, a conserved area does not lead to them being stuck more in poverty? Because they can't cut down that area, they can't necessarily use it the way they want to, they shouldn't have to be punished for that. And so we look at the social safety net, the, the, the cash transfers that government should be making to these communities who are the stewards of these conservation areas. So payment for environmental services is a great example of this kind of conditional cash transfer that can smooth their income, that can make sure they don't suffer, they're not sacrificed on the altar of conservation. 
And then finally, it's thinking about a mosaic approach and, and area-based conservation being one type of land use in a mosaic. And how do we make sure that outside of conservation areas, particularly strict conservation areas and within sustainable use conservation areas, that communities have a way to build the kind of small micro and small enterprises that can give them a pathway out of poverty and give them that self-sufficiency. And so it's about providing the business development services to help them think about what businesses look like, the extension and technical services to make that natural capital work to sustainably transform that into commodities that can be sold. And then of course, to really help them just do the marketing to get goods to market, to make sure that they can have that income transfer. That's the approach we take, but it's an absolute, as you said, Marianne, it's a proactive tool for meeting the sustainable development goals. And it's never been more important than it is now. Fantastic. Thank you, Valerie. I think, you know, one thing that strikes me listening to your, your three elements, what World Bank is doing is, you know, how do you operation, operationalize project areas as that tool? Like making sure that, you know, people do um, benefit um, not only the ones who kind of come and visit, but also those who have to actually do the conservation uh, and so forth. So that's really what we're talking about. Uh, organizations like the World Bank, the UNDP, and also others who will follow, you know, this panel, helping to operationalize this and the needs to do that. Um, but then uh, similar question to you as well as to Midori, what does the World Bank plan to do to, you know, to help to face the challenge that we you know, are still facing and continue to face? So um, what are the future plans? So for us, just like UNDP, we sort of have three key areas for future action. The first is to really find those areas where natural capital riches live side by side with terrible poverty because that paradox is something that we have to end. And that's how we show that area-based conservation is that proactive tool you talked about, Marianne. So places like Amazonas State in Brazil, this is a state that holds 20% of the Amazon. We all know the Amazon, a critically important biodiversity hotspot, climate sink. It's over 95% protected and, and, and in, in good stead in Amazonas State. And yet all of that natural capital lives side by side with some of the poorest people in Brazil. And so thinking about how do we invest there? So we've just set up a program where we put $200 million of our own money plus $60 million of GEF financing into helping that, that state do exactly what we talked about, increase the collaboration between communities, the federal government and the state government so they can do command and control, so they can stop illegal logging, so they can stop illegal destruction. We've helped them create and fix their Bolsa Floresta program, which is a, a, a very good and strong payment for environmental services program, but really building it and making it more robust so that again, those local communities who are the stewards of that forest, who have been the ones who've made the Amazon protected, that they have income, that their children aren't going hungry because they're trying to do the right thing. And then we're providing these business development services, marketing services, in order for them to think through what are the sustainable micro and small businesses that can be created, whether it's tourism, whether it's in agroforestry commodities, whether it's non-timber forest products, what does it look like so these communities can build a pathway out of poverty? So again, how do we dismantle that paradox of natural capital riches coexisting with the incredible, horrible human poverty? We have to be able to find a way through that. The second thing we're really looking at is, and this we, we are doing exactly what Midori talked about UNDP is doing, is thinking about what does COVID-19 recovery look like in some of the real economic sectors? And how is area-based conservation part of that? Two key, key examples. One is tourism. I talked a little bit about the big numbers in tourism in the Caribbean. The same is true across the globe. We know tourism is one of the most important economic sectors for many countries. Across the entirety of Latin America, it's almost 9% of their GDP. And so we're taking a whole new approach to tourism and helping countries recover tourism, recover market share by not just focusing on the business of tourism, but focusing on protecting the assets that actually attract tourists. And it's something that we haven't thought about and we haven't talked to countries about when it comes to tourism. We've tended to start with how do you grow and diversify the business and how do you share the benefits? But we forgot that the business only begins because there are assets that can be transformed into attractions for tourists. And so bringing that, protecting the assets to the center of our, of our approach on tourism is critical. Similarly, agriculture, which is obviously a key economic sector, not just in terms of commercial agriculture, in terms of small scale agriculture, it delivers food and jobs and food security for 
billions of people across the world. And one of the things that the World Bank, we, we spend a lot of time thinking about is what's going to happen to agriculture given the increase in climate change impacts. And it's not just the physical climate change, but of course, climate change, climate policy risks to agriculture and changing consumer preferences. So one of the conversations we're having around agriculture is how do we make sure area-based conservation can help mitigate all of those risks? We know how important it is to mitigate the risk of, of, from climate change, particularly in terms of managing water better. But climate policy and consumer policy is important too. Marianne, you're sitting in Europe where the, the agreement between the EU and Mercosur, for example, on agriculture is in part that change in tariffs on beef imports is predicated on that beef coming in as deforestation free. And the only way to really show that is to connect it with area-based conservation and the success of area-based conservation, the success of protected areas and conserving biodiversity and in fighting illegal logging. And so making those connections between agriculture and import markets and access to markets and market share and area-based conservation being successful is so important. And then finally, of course, we're a bank. And so the third thing we're looking at in terms of area-based conservation is building a little bit on what Midori talked about in terms of bonds. So last year in 2020, in terms of environmental, social, and social governance bonds, there was about 732 billion issued across the world. Of that, a third of that was in green bonds. Now, a lot of countries are, are chasing these bonds and are issuing green bonds, blue bonds, e all sorts of ESG bonds, SDG linked bonds, as a way not to just diversify their investor base, but to raise cheaper money. And so one of the things that, that buyers of bonds want to see is if they're going to buy a bond and get less of a return because they're willing to sacrifice some of the economic return for an environmental return, is we need to have key performance indicators in place so they can show for sure there was performance, that there has been an environmental win. And we're looking at area-based conservation as a key tool for one of those key performance indicators. How can we make sure that effective protected area management becomes one of the scores against which countries can raise cheaper capital for meeting the SDGs, all of which are important. So whether it's making sure that people who live next to natural capital don't live in poverty because of it, whether it's because we wanna make sure that key economic sectors take area-based conservation into account as critical to their success, or whether it's about making sure that when it comes to raising capital on the markets, area-based conservation can be seen as a key performance indicator to access that cheaper capital because we need money to, to meet the SDGs. The bank is really committed to taking area-based conservation very, very seriously and really seeing it as that proactive tool you mentioned, Marianne. Fantastic, thank you, Valerie. It's great and I feel rather convinced that you know um, also World Bank is is on the case like like UNDP. Um, I'm not going to go on the tangent of the Mercosur because I think it's very very interesting and maybe we will you know, I'll propose a webinar on that particular topic how you know World Bank can help <laughs> help us to make Mercosur more sustainable you know in the future. What I picked up though was an amazing tagline for an advertisement, I think, which could be, you know, run on television or movie theaters going, area-based conservation, helping you protecting your assets, um, which I think what we are talking about. So, you know, I'll take certainly that on board. But um, moving on, uh, we thank you to Valerie. We will go to a third panelist of this segment. So talking about project areas and conserved areas in a more strategic view. So um, we have, and we welcome Dr. John Robinson, um, John is also wearing a couple of hats today. So um, he is the Joan L. Tweedy Chair in Conservation Strategy at Wildlife Conservation Society, WCS, and also Vice President and Regional Counselor for North America and Caribbean at the IUCN. I hope I got that right, John, but uh, welcome and really glad you're joining us today. Um, my first question to you would be to ask you to give brief reflections for what the future holds for area-based conservation when we are now moving from the 2020 era into the towards 2030 um, biodiversity conservation. So we are hoping to get a new framework by the end of the year. It's been uh, obviously delayed um, at the global level due to the pandemic. Um, but what needs to happen um, to deliver conservation and broader sustainability goals um, in the future and how can project areas be, be part of that solution? What does the 2030 framework need to look like for us to do that? Bit of a conservation organization's point of view, please, if I may. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. And, and um, 
I just want to amplify maybe at the very beginning um, what um, Midori and Valerie were saying, which is that um, nature underlies development. Nature underlies the uh, SDGs in general. Um, this was sort of picked up by the World Economic Forum. It was picked up by UNDP in particular, who looked at the SDGs and said nature is fundamental to the delivery of the SDGs. Area-based conservation is one of the most effective tools that we have as conservationists to protect biodiversity and ecosystem services. Um, and th there's other ways to, to, to protect biodiversity besides just managing real estate, if you will, or protecting space. Um, but um, area-based conservation is frequently the best entry point that we have to do that. Um, um, as, as Midori said, um, the, um, and as Nigel emphasized, um, area-based conservation um, as, a, as an approach was really stressed in the Aichi um, meeting in Japan in 2010. That was the CBD meeting um, that, that established the Aichi targets. Um, and what Aichi did specifically was um, it began to define what area-based conservation at a policy level was all about. And it really focused on protected areas um, that were well-managed. And it also focused on these other um, OECMs, these, these um, other um, important uh, conservation measures. So um, what IT did in particular was it established a target. It said, let's protect 17% of terrestrial and inland um, um, water areas and 10% of coastal and marine areas. And that, that establishing that target was really pretty critically important to bringing the, the area-based conservation agenda to the forefront. What we've seen since 2010 is an increase in protected area coverage. Uh, and most areas have really expanded their protected area network. Um, We've got a lot of concerns about that network. Um, not all protected areas are effectively managed. They're not perhaps ecologically representative. They're not in the right places. Um, and, and actually, as you look at the progress in protecting biodiversity in general, we are continuing to lose biodiversity and we're continuing to degrade our ecosystem services. So, so what what Aichi did was it established those targets. We began to make progress. Um, uh, we began to establish more protected areas, but we were still not getting on top of the curve. Um, and um, I think the, the, the critical thing that Aichi did and didn't do, what it did was focus on protected areas. What it didn't do, it focused only on protected areas, even though Aichi itself was trying to, to, to have a broader impact. Um, countries began to focus on just those protected areas and that was, the, that was what they held themselves accountable for. What we've seen in the deliberations up to in the post 2020 global, um, global biodiversity dialogue is really for the first time, um, a commitment to establishing um, ecosystem integrity. Um, and, and that becomes a, a, an, an organizing principle because as, as you begin to think about establishing that ecosystem integrity, you need to begin to scale up your thinking. So what, what um, and again, we, haven't, we don't have the final text um, um, that's gonna come out of the, of the Kunming meeting in October, but we can begin to see what the framework is. Um, one of the core elements is uh, target one which basically talks about retaining intact and wilderness areas. So these are bigger areas. These are not just simply protected areas. And as we begin to think about area-based conservation, again, we see this beginning to scale up. What, what, the, uh, what the target two of the convention focuses on is the same set of targets as Aichi did, which was let's focus on protected areas but also let's look at effective area-based, other effective area-based conservation measures, OECMs. And those OECMs, 
become um, a topic of a lot of discussion. What are OECMs exactly? Um, and quite clearly, they are not just national protected areas. There are other kinds of extractive areas, sustainable use areas, areas managed by indigenous people, um, um, private areas, areas managed by NGOs, et cetera, et cetera. And so all of those other areas become part of our effort to develop area-based conservation. I think what is coming out of the CBD is a recognition that single protected areas by themselves are likely to be insufficient. So we, be, we begin to think about interconnected systems of protected areas. Um, and, and, it's, and it's interesting that over the last really 10 years, that that has begun to sink into the realization of the conservation and development community that indeed, if you, if you are trying to protect ecosystem integrity, you have to scale up the thinking. Um, and we've got some wonderful examples emerging from around the world. So you have uh, Brazil creating in their national system of protected areas, the Mosaico de Unidades de Conservação, which are the, the, the a mosaic of conservation areas. Let's think about mosaics of conservation areas as we think about area-based conservation. Uh, we have China establishing a national wide system of biodiversity conservation priority areas. Um, um, those areas, those B BCPAs and the mosaics in Brazil tend to be big. They, they are, if, if, um, if you actually kind of look at them, they tend to be between 50 and 100,000 square kilometers in size. It's, uh, it's those systems then that allow us to begin to think about protecting um, um, ecosystem integrity as a whole. And in, uh, protecting that ecosystem integrity as a whole allows us to deliver on both biodiversity, um, on ecosystem services, and ultimately because nature is underlying all of the SDGs, it allows us to deliver on all of the SDGs directly. Um, we're beginning to see this in um, the thinking of a, uh, of a lot of um, NGOs as well. African Parks has taken a real leadership position in kind of thinking about African Parks and thinking not just about a single protected area, but placing that single protected area within a larger landscape. Um, and it is that larger landscape for protected areas, other OECMs that give us the, the opportunity to use area-based conservation to protect um, ecosystem integrity. Um, my own organization, WCS, is focusing on what we call nature strongholds. Those, these are large, again, large areas, 50 to 100,000 square kilometers in size, which have got a lot of different kinds of protected areas. So as we think to the future, what we're quite clearly seeing is, um, we are, we're trying to protect more systems. We're using systems and mosaics of connected protected areas and OECMs to be able to do that. Um, and, and so the, the scaling up gives us considerably more, more conservation impact. Fantastic, thank you, John. And listeners, I hope you were listening carefully because you know what John just did there was outlining why in the context of this guidance, we really take the effort and make the effort of talking about area-based conservation and also always saying protected and conserved areas, even though if it takes a slightly longer time, and you know, I'm always almost tripping over my tongue while I say that, but that's precisely because you know we shouldn't only focus on protected areas, but much broader set of conservation through looking at um, it through the area-based lens. So thanks, John, for doing that. Um, my second question to you is um, focused on, you know, what you heard from uh, Valerie and Vidori earlier. So very briefly, in the interest of, interest of, of time, could you give one or two um, wishes what we as a conservation community um, and you perhaps as, uh, you know, a representative of you know, IUCN, WCS, you would like to see from the more development focused organizations like UNDP and World Bank in the future to make what you just said happen in the 2030 horizon. So one or two key examples, yeah, our wish so list. <laughs> well, I will be very brief. You know, I think, I think um, uh, this idea of scaling up the, the impact of investments 
uh, is something that the uh, development and donor community is really taking on. Uh, the European, European Union looked at Africa in 2015 and said, let's think about larger key landscapes for conservation. And again, this is an attempt to wed together all of these different land uses, both protected areas, OECMs, other kinds of conserved areas. Um, and they went across the whole continent and they defined a strategy to do that, which was hugely important. They did the th same thing for Asia. Um, and um, picking up a little bit on what um, Valerie was saying earlier, you know, a very powerful example of that is sort of emerging from um, um, the GEF and the World Bank, which is looking at the watersheds of the Amazon basin, um, thinking about integrated watershed management projects. And specifically, um, there is a project being initiated in the Putumayo basin, which is a basin of 118,000 square kilometers. Big piece of real estate, lots of different kinds of land uses, indigenous peoples, extractive areas, protected areas, and they are tr they are trying to look at it at scale. Can we can can we think about the whole thing at a broader scale? I might just sort of add very briefly at the end that quite clearly the as we come out of COVID, and this is a slightly different issue, but as we come out of COVID, we need to think about investing in directly in protected areas and other conserved areas. Um, these are areas which have been hammered by COVID. Um, and that is something that I hope the development community and clearly as we listen to uh, Valerie and Midori, we need to be, be, they are thinking very clearly about that and we need to deliver on that. And the other element of that is as we build back better, we wanna make sure that the subsidies that we have and we put into place are nature positive subsidies. Yeah not nature negative subsidies. So thank you very much. Absolutely, thanks John for that. Indeed, we are now talking about this nature positive um, type of recovery, you know, good recovery, building back better, building back better on nature. So I think these are the slogans that you know, we certainly as a community need to be uh, sharing around both as a conservation, but also a development community. Um, I thank the first panelist. Thank you, Midori. Thank you, Valerie. Thank you, John. It was a really good and rich start of the conversation also showing what's already happening and we're ending with a bit of a wish list and we're looking forward as to what needs to happen in this space to really scale up um, this development. Um, I invite all of all three of you to take a look at you know, the conversation, the QAs. I saw at least there's a one question from Midori there, you know, asking more about the One Health Initiative and so forth. And I thank the audience, you know, um, chatting away and also asking questions. That's fantastic. And also thank Nigel, who is from our side, you know, manning the QA, so you know, doing that. But uh, please, if you know panelists are still so inclined um, to take a look at if there's something with their name on it, uh, please, uh, please do feel free to answer. While we're going to be swiftly moving on to the second segment of the panel, which now brings us more to the on the ground level um, and looking at our case studies and looking at this topic through the uh, lens of our case studies that we've been um, identifying and uh, documenting over the course of the past year. So as the first speaker of the panelists, I would like to welcome Dr. Julia Gorisha, who is the program officer South America for WWF Germany. Um, Hi, Julia. Nice to have you with us today. Hi, Marianne. Thank you for having us. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, so your case study, the one that you you um, you authored and and, and uh, had co-authors working with you, falls under the SDG 16, Peace, Justice, and Strong Institutions, which perhaps isn't the first SDG that comes to mind when, when people think about you know what can area-based conservation um, do for our sustainability. So could you start off by telling very briefly first where's your case study located and what were the sustainability challenges that people and the area were facing um, and we can you know start the conversation from that. Yeah absolutely and I, I, I agree with you Marianne that actually the link between protected areas and area-based conservation is not that clear to peace and justice. And I think the guidelines did a very good job in trying to identify the key arguments and also different case studies from the one in Colombia that I'm going to present to also Kenya and Myanmar. And specifically the case in Colombia is, uh, as you all know, Colombia has been a phase for, for more than 50 years, one of the longest Western Hemisphere armed conflict. 
And this case study is uh, the case of Alto Fragua in the Huasan National Park, which is based in the south of Colombia. And it's a very important uh, national park regarding uh, biodiversity because it's meant to conserve one biodiversity hotspot that goes from the Andes down to the Amazon plain. So it's really important from biodiversity perspective, but it also is uh, in a region that has been affected by violent conflict in Colombia for many years. It was actually created in 2002 in the middle of a very acute violence phase in Colombia, just for example, four days before a, a huge political crisis in the country. And, and in that, so, and WWF has been active from the beginning, I will say for more than 10 years in this region, but the sustainability challenge we saw and also the, the in National Parks Agency in this case is, related to access to land. So as you know, access to land has been at the core of the violence and armed conflict in Colombia. And for protected areas in Colombia, that means that land tenancy a use of natural, of natural resources create a lot of conflicts between the national parks and the people that use there. And usually these people are small farmers that have been victims of the conflict that has been displaced by the conflict. And so, for example, we know that we have right now in Colombia almost 30,000 small farmers uh, without access to land that use or occupy 37 of the 59 national parks category one we have in Colombia. So that's a huge pro pro a problem in terms of trying to do effective protected area management. And also because this, uh, for looking at it from the, from the side of the communities, these communities or these uh, farmers are in vulnerable conditions, not only because they were impacted by the armed conflict, but also because uh, they are, uh, by doing, by living in a national park or by, by doing different types of activities from cattle ranching as uh, coca cultivation, which is what happens in Colombia as well, they don't have access to state services, education, health, basic services they need for a good living. So, and this was the case in Alto Fragua National Park since the beginning, basically. And, and in that sense, the national park needed to, to come with the support of different types of organizations, including WF, with a conservation solution in order to respond to the challenge. How is it possible to do conservation in this type of really complex context as the one has just described. Fantastic, thank you, Julia. And then in that context, what solutions did the conservation bring? Um, and perhaps you know, following up from that, that question as well, uh, based on your experience, you know, what would be perhaps the key lessons learned from Colombia, from this case study, how area-based conservation can support SDG 16, particularly like one or two key lessons? Yeah, absolutely. So, what the approach that that the national parks, uh, national park, and the, the uh, NGOs took was to promote an inclusive conservation approach, and by that I mean to really work with the local communities and and recognize the role they have in nature conservation, and also to hear their rights and their needs. So by doing that and also empowering them, working with their leaders in order for their leaders to voice their concerns and to participate in the in governance planning, for example, we managed to uh, promote conservation agreements with these communities. And basically a conservation agreement, what it, what it, what it aims is to, to secure the protected area management and to improve it, but on the other side, also to provide communities with actual solutions to improve their vulnerability or the situation of vulnerability and to have uh, better sustainable livelihoods. Uh, so, and basically by doing this, uh, in this case, we were able, the protected area national park is not that big, it's 70,000 hectares, but we almost managed uh, to, to get conservation agreements in key areas that were deforested so that these areas were left alone. And also we encourage uh, with this work with the local community, 
a community-based conservation initiative outside the protected area, so in the landscape, and to have a more sustainable management. And by that, right now we have, for example, uh, almost a similar 7,000 hectares outside, outside of the National Park Conserve. And, and that is, not, is a huge uh, result in, again, an area that is really violent, is not stable, and have a lot of challenges still in Colombia. And also from the community and the, the, the key part with the peace building is that the whole process gave them, empowered them, gave them a reason to stay in the territory. So for example, not to be displaced from the territory, which is a huge uh, uh, challenge in Colombia, and a reason to feel part of the territory. And I do think this, this is really important. So, so coming back to your question of the two key lessons that we can learn from this case and in, in Colombia in general, doing protected area conservation in an inclusive way, I think is that we need to be aware that in those contexts, that, that I mean co contexts that have been impacted by armed conflict or transition into peace or post conflicts, protected areas management needs to be conflict sensitive and adopt a no harm approach. And this is really important because as we know, most biodiversity, biodiversity places in the world have been affected by violence and conflict and, and, and this type of a political context. So this not only applies to Colombia, but a lot and organizations as us, WWF need, uh, need to learn a lot still on this. What does that mean? No? And how can we do our conservation work in this uh, difficult context? And basically by doing this, I do believe we are going to contribute not to worsen the, the really uh, bad conditions or, or create more violence, et cetera. But it's also this inclusive conservation approach provides an opportunity to, um, to peace building, for example, that many times is a priority in these regions and in these territories. It is not the priority of nature conservation organization as us, but if we do our conservation work in a in this inclusive way, we can actually contribute to, to noble or other objectives such as peace building. Um, and in that sense, I, I think it's a right direction to, to, to reflect on this, how we can work better with the inclusive conservation approach, meaning uh, giving the local communities and the right or, or the space to, to voice their rights and work together as partners, and also to, to be very aware of our role as organizations. Fantastic, thank you, Julia. Um, so yes, what you identified there was indeed the inclusive conservation approach, you know, with the very big emphasis on the word inclusive, and through that, the empowerment of, the, um, of people around and in the project areas and their support. And what always strikes me here, which perhaps you didn't mention so explicitly, but you know, through that type of approach and through that type of role that uh, protected area management can play is provide a certain type of governance structure in areas mm. where it's it's needed. And obviously, you know, as you said, you know, it's not the role, primary role of area-based conservation or the organizations involved, um, official and you know, supporting like WWF, but that kind of tends to be and can happen. And that can play a really big role in that peace building, peace maintenance. Um, so in a way, organizations that work in conservation can end up taking a bit more of a share than they thought initially, or would they be role, but that's just, you know, is, is the case. And it has been seen working out well and supportively around the world. Um, so I think that's one of the lessons that I've certainly learned from through this publication, through these case studies as well. Uh, thank you, Julia. Moving on from SDG 16, as we talk in you know, SDG abbreviations now, obviously, in this kind of event, to other SDGs. Um, and I would like to welcome David Wilkie, uh, who is ex Executive Director from WCS, for presenting a case study um, how area-based conservation can support SDGs number 10 and 5. And those who don't know their SDGs, what we're talking about here, we're talking about equity and also gender equity. So welcome, David. Really nice to have you here with us today. Um, like um, Julia, I would like to first ask you to introduce your case study um, and what was the sustainability challenge that you are facing and then also you know, where in the world are we with your case study? Thank you, Marianne, um, and thanks all of the people who uh, who are attending this this webinar today. That I noticed there's 134 people online. This is absolutely fantastic. I'm going to talk about an area in northwestern 
Bolivia, where WCS has been working for over 20 years. The, the area is called Medidi, the Medidi landscape, and it's, it's, it's an absolutely remarkable place. The Medidi landscape goes from the high Andes glaciers 6,000 meters down to the lowland forests on the Tuichi and Beni rivers. That altitudinal gradient provides vast numbers of different habitats. And when you have lots of different habitats along an altitudinal gradient, you have spectacular numbers of uh, diversity of species. There's over 5,000 species of plants. There's over 1,000 species of birds. That's 9% of the species of birds on the planet. Absolutely amazing. There's 254 mammal species, 119 amphibians, 113 reptiles, and over 300 species of fish. This is an extraordinarily biodiverse place. But biodiversity aside and remarkable intactness, these areas are still incredibly intact and, and retain their ecological functions. But when WCS arrived in that landscape about 25 years ago, we, we realized there were really three intersecting factors that were jeopardizing the, the long-term biodiversity in the, in the area and, and also risking the, the, the well-being and cultural identity of several indigenous peoples who've lived in, those, in this landscape for millennia. These three things were, were might, might, well, the first one might be a bit of a surprise. Medidi National Park established in 1995 is 18,000 square kilometers. Now you might think, oh my goodness, that is immense. But many of the species resident in Medidi National Park actually thought the park was too small. White lip peccaries and jaguar basically spent a bunch of time in Medidi National Park, but about a third of the time outside the park. Now, 18,000 square kilometers, you'd think that was big enough, but the white lip peccaries and the jaguar said no. The Andean condor up in the Altiplano also said no. They spend a lot of the time outside of Medidi National Park, and so do Andean bear or spectacled bear. So basically, the animals were saying 18,000 kilometers is large, but it's not big enough. And many of these animals spent much of their time in adjacent lands that are the traditional territories of indigenous peoples. In 1995, around that time, the Bolivian government was strongly advocating and enabling the movement of Andean peoples, indigenous peoples in the high Andes, down into the lowlands to clear areas for crops, to raise cattle, and to fell trees for timber. So basically the highland indigenous peoples were deforesting lowland indigenous peoples lands. And at that time, the government of Bolivia did not formally recognize the territorial claims of lowland indigenous peoples like the Takana, the Chimani, and the Lejo. So WCS thought if we can if we can support the efforts of the lowland indigenous peoples to secure their rights and to build the governance systems they need to exercise their rights, we could probably deal with these three issues. The park not big enough, uh, uncontrolled immigration from the highlands, and the lack of, the lack of um, secure rights for lowland indigenous peoples. So that that was really what drove WCS's efforts in this area. Thank you, David. So this is um, the classic case, isn't it, for the conservation community, uh, which I think the, certainly I represent and you perhaps represent as well, which is you start with an issue, which perhaps you know, is your conservation issue, species related issue, and you end up really looking at the root cause and you end up in this space of sustainability more broadly, and you end up looking at land use rights. You end up creating frameworks for um, sustainable development rather than you know, prime, first and foremost, you know, conservation of a species. Um, and I think this is the case study. This case study fantastically shows that, and also through that approach, when you understand that what you can actually deliver for, Indeed, equity and even gender equity that is 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 the case with this with this case study. So, what was then you know the solution conservation was bringing more concretely? And same question to you as well as I've you know asked from um, from Julia. What would be the two key lessons that 
you would put forward through your case study lens to others who would be particularly exploring to perhaps use area-based conservation to support equity-related challenges um, in their context. Well, Marianne, I think I think the fact that in in 2003 that the, the, the government of Bolivia formally recognized 50% of the territorial claims of the Takana. That's about 4,000 square kilometers. That, that, that alone was an equity issue. That, that alone um, recognized and, and respected and protected the, uh, the rights of the Takana. The, the same goes for the Lejos. Uh, the Lejos in, in 2007, um, their rights to about 25% of their territorial claims were recognized. And their, their territory completely overlaps the uh, Pilon Lajas National Park. So suddenly you had a group who, whose rights to their traditional territories were excluded because it was a national park. Suddenly, that, suddenly uh, CERNAP, the National Park Agency, had to negotiate with the, with the Lejo and, and the Takana, because some of the Takana lands overlap Mididi National Park. They had to negotiate what the, what the use rights, what the regulatory framework would be that, that would both protect biodiversity and yet respect the, the, the resource access and use rights uh, of indigenous communities. I think those two things were a remarkable uh, uh, change in, in the equitable benefit sharing from good stewardship. But, you know, I think it was Valerie, you were talking about how important it is to have access to natural resources as a pathway out of poverty. And I think that's absolutely true. One of the biggest challenges of, of uh, area-based conservation in places where the, the, the ecosystems are relatively intact is these places tend to be isolated from markets. So actually creating uh, it, uh, enterprises that can be a pathway out of poverty for people, it, it's really complicated because unless you've got very high value and low weight ratio goods, the cost of transportation of getting these goods to market typically makes them unprofitable. And what we found working with the Takana and the Chimani and the Lejos is that helping communities build a portfolio of enterprises is really, really important. And it's important for several reasons. One, single, single, and single commodity enterprises tend not, be, because of the mark, distance to markets, tend not to make a huge amount of money. But a portfolio of enterprises, it ha has in aggregate a much higher value for intact forests or intact landscapes. Not only does a portfolio do that, it, in, in aggregate it's more valuable, but it, it, it smooths consumption, it smooths uh, revenues when you have market shocks. If, if for some reason the price of timber goes down, if you're only supporting your your, your community on timber, you're in deep trouble. But if you've got a portfolio of things, so that the Takana, they hunt and sell caiman skins to, uh, uh, to Gucci, in fact. They sell the meat to a, to a high-end restaurant in La Paz. They harvest wild cacao. They, har they cut trees. All of these enterprises at a sustainable level produce, pr produce money but, they, but they're in fantastic for, for smoothing revenues when you've got market shocks. The portfolio also has a huge impact on, on equity in, in benefit sharing because timber is a man's job. Re ha harvesting cacao, that's women tend to do that. So what you get is by having a portfolio of enterprises, you get different sectors of a community benefiting from sustainable use benefiting from good area-based management. So women benefit, youth benefit. By having a portfolio of enterprises, I think it's the, the most remarkable way that sustainable natural resource management can benefit all members of a society. Thank Fantastic. You, Thanks, David. And I'm really glad that you know one of the key lessons learned you picked up and so clearly uh, 
explain to our audience as well was that portfolio of enterprises, a diversification that you know can be supported um, through conservation framework and organizations that are part of it. And this is definitely one of the key, key case studies um, in our report highlighting it. Um, so I invite everybody to take a look at it. I think it's really quite beautifully highlights, you know, what, what can what can happen and, and uh, how can, how do I say, it? how can such a kind of an economic perspective actually trickle into the equity space, um, as you as you explained. Um, but again, conscious of the time, while we could be chatting here all day long, um, <laughs> which I would certainly love to do, um, I'll have to leave David aside, thank you, and take us from Latin America um, to the African continent and South Africa. So our final panelists on this segment of more concrete case study based um, insights into the guidance is Louise Stafford. She's the program director for TNC South Africa and TNC stands for the Nature Conservancy. So um, Louise, really happy to have you with us. Uh, welcome. And you're gonna be speaking about how area-based conservation on a more broad or even regional level can support SDG6, which is obviously our SDG for clear, clean water. So I gave it away already. We are now in South Africa, but more specifically, Louis, where's your case study located and what is the sustainability challenge that area-based conservation is addressing in that area? Thank you, Marianne. Uh, this uh, case study is in the Cape Floristic region. Uh, now, the Cape Floristic region is the smallest of the six floral kingdoms uh, in the world. It's the only one that's contained within one country, and it's a biodiversity hotspot. There's more than nine and a half thousand plants of which 70% or over 70% are endemic. In other words, it occurs nowhere else on earth. It has the most, the highest uh, concentration of plant species in the world. But this area is a, a part of, there's a large part of it that's protected. But uh, as many of the previous speakers said, one cannot only look at the areas within protected um, environments. Uh, in the case of the Cape Floristic region, many of the areas are uh, uh, old forestry exit areas or areas where uh, timber plantations are still uh, found within the areas. And timber plantations in the case here are uh, mostly pine. And pine trees have a tendency of um, being uh, able to invade uh, areas that's, that, that, that it's windblown seed, so it can, in, uh, can invade large areas outside the, the timber plantations. And then also the, 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 the uh, conservation agencies that are tasked with the, the, the job of managing these protected areas do not always have the capacity and insufficient resources to look after this, um, this asset. Some of the threats that, in, in addition to the threats of, of uh, uh, inability of conservation agencies to manage these protected areas, uh, population increase uh, is, uh, increases the need for resources, uh, increases the need for water, for land, and that has this if, uh, impact on habitat loss. Uh, we know that global climate change is a reality. Cape Town faced the situation where it almost ran out of wood, uh, water two years ago. Um, and droughts is going to become part of the new normal. Um, another threat that's very uh, significant in this area is the threat of invasive plants. And as I mentioned, many of the protected areas are close to uh, old uh, and existing timber plantations and are prone to um, being invaded by, by, amongst others, pine trees. And pine trees are thirsty. Um, we've done a study for the Greater Cape Town Water Funds business case in 2018, where we calculated, or that studies have shown that um, the, the region currently loses 55 billion liters of water every year. And uh, as a result of alien trees in the, the, the watersheds. And if nothing is done about this, um, the water losses will double within 20 years. Now for an area that almost ran out of water, this is quite a big deal. Another threat to the biodiversity of this uh, very unique uh, floral kingdom is uh, frequent, too frequent fires. Fainbos is a fire-driven species. It has to burn 
about every 12 to 15 years to rejuvenate. But now we have invaded areas where pine trees are present, the fires are more frequent, difficult to control and more destructive. And in addition to, and I've mentioned the growing uh, population, so there's a need for more water. And what happens now is when it rains, we look at our reservoirs and say, oh, good, we've got water. But what we forget is that there are rivers downstream from these reservoirs that need the constant or that need a, a environmental reserve to sustain the, the systems. And that doesn't happen because of the need for water uh, the, the threat of the supply um, or the demand outstripping the supply, we tend to hold onto the water, not release it into the, into the freshwater ecosystems. We're choking the rivers to death. Also, it has a downstream effect that farmers who depend on the rivers for water for their cattle and for their, 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 uh, 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 the crops cannot access the water for parts of the year because it's too saline and we're also losing wetlands uh, along the way. So there's this, this uh, it has, it, it, uh, with climate change and with population growth, the threats are exacerbated. Yeah. I can, I can hear, you know, that you have a quite a puzzle at your hands there you know, around the Cape Town region, Louise. So then briefly, um, how can and how has, because it's also a case study which is, you know, um, shows, you know, how things have already been done uh, effectively, area-based conservation um, support, the situation in a way that you know Cape Town still gets water. And what would be your two maximum two key lessons learned from your case study, from your region, to share with with others um, who are looking to use area-based conservation, perhaps also in a regional context, to support um, water supply, sustainable water supply. Well, we have. Um, so, uh, if one look at where areas to protect um, where these strategic areas that strategic for water supply are important to protect um, and what we have learned is that nature-based solutions is the most cost effective way of supplying water uh, a study uh, when comparing nature-based solutions to for example in the Cape Town case to desalination which was one of the options that the city of Cape Town uh, considered for, um, for for water augmentation it's a return on investment of 351 um, percent and we need innovation that's the second uh, lesson um, we cannot expect different results if we keep doing the same uh, going down the same mountain we need to build institutional capacity and some of the, inst the in innovations is collective act action. We're not used to work together, different NGOs with the private and the public sector. Um, and uh, uh, one of the uh, a model that we found was very successful globally, uh, it's a the water fund model, uh, it's scalable, it's replicable, and it's, a, it's bringing public and private sector together where in, in innovative ways of funding uh, the actions that so desperately needed to sustain uh, protected areas, to sustain water source areas, and to help us meet the SDGs, um, is, is uh, we found that quite to be quite a, a, a effective and uh, a model that that uh, has already it's it's a, a, it proved it's a proof of concept that it can work. Thank you, fantastic, Louise, and I, I think I'm taking up the point. The phrase you use at the very end, which is proof of concept, because you know, for us talking about nature-based solution being the most cost-effective one, particularly for you know water delivery at the regional scale, this particular case study that you've provided for this uh, guidance shows it very clearly, evidence-basedly with the you know, cost evidence, um, benefit evidence, backing it up, and then showing that it can work. So really, definitely proof of concept, um, which can be hopefully helpful also others around the world. Um, Thank you, everybody. Uh, five minutes ago, and I'm not even going to try to sum up things, you know, at the very end of this uh, this rich conversation. Um, but I'm going to move more swiftly on to saying thank yous and and perhaps you know trying to move towards also highlighting the call for action that this guidance was. Um, it is going to be an important year for climate and biodiversity uh, both. We're having both important conferences of parties this year, and we do really hope that. 
from different levels of governance, from different um, angles of stakeholders and parties involved, our message and the evidence that we provided through this, this guidance will start to trickle through and also you know, we'll provide uh, evidence and impetus, impetus for these discussions uh, that will be coming this year uh, or, or happening this year, but also you know, when the year is over and we move on to the implementation. So really it is a call for action to start to think even more and more and with inviting broader communities to look at area-based conservation through the lens of SDGs across the different SDGs, not only thinking it through as we can deliver our nature-based uh, nature conservation goals uh, through this, we can deliver so so much more as we try to show you today. Um, so we really invite you all to take these ideas um, and these concrete case studies on board with your thinking and, and take them forward in the way that you can, wherever you work at whichever level you work. Um, here is a community of experts around this virtual table, but also you will see more names and case study names when you look at, our, look at our publication, which you can reach out to. So I'd also invite you to do that. I think everybody around this table hopefully agrees because we really are trying to snowball this agenda. So um, with that, hopefully we will be making even more of a case for nature-based, nature-positive um, recovery from COVID and sustainable future on that. Um, but as I said, moving on to thank yous with my final last minutes, I would very, very much, and from the bottom of my heart, like to thank the partners for this, um, for this, um, what we think is a pioneering guidance, uh, looking at you know the evidence base and also providing guidance how to do things uh, on conservation and SDGs. So thank you for all the panelists who represent also our partnerships. My big thank you for all the case study authors, only few of whom were with us around this virtual table today, but I think a number of them were perhaps in the audience and you see their names um, duly represented in, in the uh, publication. And obviously, of course, you know, thanks to the audience um, who were with us. And also thank you for all the active discussion and questions that were happening while, while we were talking. It was nice to see that taking place as well. So from my part, and I think also through me, um, through the partnership of this behind this, um, um, this publication, I, I thank you all and I put forward the call for action as to all of us take this forward to the best means and uh, we can. And on that final note, I will invite you to our second IEP led event, which is going to be taking place 22nd of June. Um, you've heard us now discussing this through the lens of perhaps organizations that um, even though work on the ground, but still perhaps represent, you know, a bit higher level of conservation and sustain sustainable development. On the, sec um, the 22nd of June, uh, through IEP, we will be talking to rangers. So looking at project areas and project areas and concerned area rangers and how they are the key workers, the term that has been used a lot this year, but how they are the key workers for delivering SDGs uh, through area-based conservation. So from our side, I invite you to join us on the 22nd of June. And I do hope as well, keep an eye on the partnerships and their, their, their events and websites as to them taking forward this, uh, this guidance. So with that, big thank you to everybody around this virtual table. Big thank you to the audience and uh, let's take this agenda forward.